The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None of them. I want to address myself now to problems as they exist in the black community across America. And America cannot be considered as a stable and just society. But no stable and just society can mount a successful offensive against black youth who break a window and at the same time plead that it is powerless to protect black youth who are being murdered because they seek to make American democracy a reality. Each time a black church is bombed or burnt, that is violence in our streets. Each time a black body is found in the swamps of Mississippi and Alabama, that is violence in our land. Each time black right workers cannot be protected by the government, that is anarchy. Each time a police officer shoots and kills a black teenager, that is urban crime. You see, we recognize America for what it is, the Fourth Reich. And we tell America to be on notice because if you are going to play Nazis, black folks ain't going to play Jews. Politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None other. What moved you to that position? Hmm. I think we're always, we're always products of our time. And as to the coming together of certain events and ability more than anything else, I guess would, would contribute to any person uh, being recognized. Down in Alabama, I became uh, the director of the state of Alabama. At this particular time, Kwame Ture was the chairman of SNCC. And the upcoming year, when he was supposedly uh, to be re-elected, he decided that he didn't want to continue as chairman, which opened it up. And uh, I was elected as chairman you know, of SNCC at that particular time. It was in 67. Again, uh, he had many different things uh, at play. There were many different forces at play in terms of the rejection of, of nonviolence as a position or attitude, which was again being best exemplified in the northern and urban areas. In '65, he had the Watts Rebellion. In New York, in '64, there was a rebellion. So that whole attitude of you know defending oneself was prevalent in the movement at that time. So again, it's uh, contributed toward my understanding and development as much as anything else. You never espoused uh, violence per se, but only as a tactic toward self-defense. It is a tactic, it, it is a tactic, but see, violence is an that's the American way of life. This is what we learned before anything else, that it's the American way of life. Much like if we, we there's a, a prologue that comes on before Superman, in which it says, you know, Superman, he fights for truth, justice, and the American way. Not truth, justice, in the American way, or truth, justice, the inference being the American way. The American way is something totally different from that. So again, the American way has always been violent, has always, you know, been predicated upon being violent. So it was a part of that which we understood and we knew. Was all of that, all of that struggle, all of that pain that you went through, when you look at today, was it worth it? Well, I think our analysis of struggle has to be as such that it's an ongoing process. If our analysis of struggle is that it began in the 50s, we can reason that it ended in the 60s, which is not the case. When the first African rebelled against being enslaved, he gave an alternative to slavery that has been built upon even until now. What we saw in the, in the 50s and the 60s was movement. And there had been many movements before. There had been the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement, the Niagara movement, the civil rights movement, the free speech movement. You know, there have been movements, movements that visit struggle. But struggle is an ongoing process. So even today, we are in the midst of struggle. Again, struggle is at a different level than it was at that particular time. What do you see today? Again, there are more components, you know, who are aligned to participate in struggle today than there were in the 60s. You don't you see, see anything analogous to the Panther Party or SNCC today? Well, those organizations serve their purpose, but th there are organizations that will come into being who will be activists, 
and will be the activism will be similar and more intense in, in many instances because we have to understand that SNCC evolved into a point and then the Panthers became a reality but the Panthers was not the final organization after the Panthers there was the BLA so again you know that whole sense of in, in involvement and what happened in terms of the BLA is that the population the base there was no real base to sustain military action but what do we see happening today? You see in terms of there is a kind of attitude amongst the young people today that is militaristic. militaristic. You have people, and although the energy is misdirected and many people may put it down in terms of the fratricide that's going on, how else do you train an army in this country? So you view what you see happening in the urban centers as constructive it, or positive? It's not constructive or, or positive, but again, it is something that always is the prelude to armed struggle in any country. That has always been the case. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None other. I give you Rav, Rav Brown, Rav. I'd like to start off by thanking Brother Cleveland and the Black Panther Party for self-defense. You see, unlike America would have us believe, the greatest problem confronting this country today is not pollution and bad breath. It's black people. It's black people. See, that's just one of the big lies that America tells you and that you go for because you chumps. You go for it. One of the lies that we tell ourselves is that we're making progress. But Huey's chair is empty. We're not making progress. We tend to equate progress with concessions. We can no longer make that mistake. You see, when they gave us that nigga astronaut, you say we were making progress, but I told you they were going to lose him in space. He didn't get that far. They gave you Thurgood Marshall and you said we were making progress. Thurgood Marshall is a term of the highest order. Anybody who sits down before, anybody who sits before James O. Eastland, a camera breath, pick a wood, nasty hunky from Mississippi. Let James O. Eastland subject him to the type of questioning that he did. He's a strange breed of man. You put Adam Clayton Powell in office and you couldn't keep him. What you think they're going to do with Thurgood Marshall when they get tired of him? They gave you Walter Washington of Washington, D.C., and you said we were making progress. That's not progress. See, it's no in-between. You're either free or you're a slave. There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. That's like telling me you can be a little bit pregnant. only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None other. There is no difference between the Democratic and Republican Party. The, the similarities are greater than the differences of those parties. What's the difference between Lynchum Johnson and Goldwater? None. But a lot of you running around talking about you Democrats, and the Democrats got you in the biggest trick going. They tell you it ain't our fault. It's the Dixocrats. There's no such thing as a Dixocrat. The only difference between George Wallace and Lyndon Johnson is one of them's wife got cancer.
but you go for it. You go for it because you chumps. You go for it. The only thing that's gonna free you is gunpowder. Black powder. Huey Newton is the only living revolutionary in this country today. He has paid his dues. He paid his dues. How many white folks you killed today? But you revolutionaries, you are revolutionaries. Che Guevara says it's only two ways to leave the battlefield. Victorious or dead, you is in jail. That's no victory, that's a concession. When black people become serious about the revolutionary struggle that they are caught up in, whether they recognize it or not, when they begin to go down and knock off people who are oppressing them and begin to render these people impotent, that's when the revolutionary struggle unfolds. Not until. See, I want to develop upon what Bobby was talking about, about green power, because green power is a myth. There's no such thing as green power as long as that honky got the power to change the color of money. It's power that controls this country to show you America's wandering use and abuse of power in connection with money. Internationally, America changed the international gold standard from the monetary standard from gold to paper gold. Her gold reserve had to window to $13.7 billion. France had 12.9. That's why De Gaulle was raising all that hell. The Gaulle says, I got almost as much gold as you. So how are you going to have more votes than me in the monetary system? The United States got slick because they had power. They changed it to something that they got abundance of, paper gold. Paper gold. You see, black folks are chumps. If America were to tell you to bring all the rocks in this country to her, and she'll give you a million dollars for it, you'll do it. And the next day she'll tell you, we're using rocks for currencies, chump. You go for it because you enjoy being lied to. You enjoy being lied to. You find your security in the lies that white America tells you. For 400 years, she taught you white nationalism and you lapped it up. You taught it to your children. You had your children thinking that everything black was bad. Black cows don't give good milk. Black hens don't lay eggs. Black for funerals, white for weddings. You see, everything black is bad. The only black biblical character you knew was Judas. That's all. Serve for black draft. That's white nationalism, Santa Claus, a white honky who slides down a black chimney and comes out white. Flush colored band-aids. They had a brother who put one on and thought something was wrong with his skin. That's cause you chumps, you go for it. You enjoy white nationalism. Huntley and Brinkley, black folks got more confidence in Huntley and Brinkley than Catholics got in the Pope. They believe anything. According to Huntley and Brinkley, we threw fighting in Vietnam. We threw killing the enemy, we shooting trees. But you go for it, that's what you wanna hear. And you say that you're revolutionaries. But if you are revolutionaries, you must assume the revolutionary posture. Chairman Mao says power comes from the barrel of a gun.
Yes, politics is war without bloodshed, and war is an extension of those politics. But there is no politics in this country that's relevant to us, to black people. Bobby Kennedy sold black people out. He doesn't, he's not interested in black people. He called for vigilante action this summer. He says that the good citizens should ban with the policemen to put down lawbreakers. You know who lawbreakers are in this country. Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson has set the attitude, the, the atmosphere rather, rather, for vigilanteism in the country. When he came out in his latest speech, I guess you call it, and said, that one day law-abiding citizens will rise up to put down the lawbreakers and one week later the longshoremen went over and beat the peace movement up with hooks. That's vigilante action. The same thing happened during the Battle of Algiers, the Algerian Revolution, when France passed the proclamation establishing people's militias. That's what this country is doing. That's why white folks are buying guns. They're buying them for you. And understand, Class differences will not save you. There is no such thing as a black middle class. You don't believe it? Go to Detroit. There's no such thing as a black middle class. The man does not beat your head because you got a Cadillac or because you got a Ford. He beats you because you're black. Class structures are a luxury that we cannot afford. They cannot divide us by saying that you're middle class or you're lower class. He kills you because you're black. The concentration camps, they got 37 in the country and me and Carmichael can't fill all of them. They got to be taking somebody else. You got to stop dividing yourselves. You got to organize. I agree with Bobby. We are not outnumbered, we are out organized. You have to organize on every level. Everybody in the black community must organize. And then we decide whether we will have alliances with other people or not, but not until we are organized. In terms of the revolution, I believe that the revolution will be a revolution of dispossessed people in this country. That's the Mexican-American, the Puerto Rican-American, the American Indian, and black people. We happen to be the vanguard of that revolutionary struggle because we are the most dispossessed. An old African leader says, about leadership. He says that leadership should never be shared. It should always remain in the hands of the dispossessed people. We will lead the revolution. I want to end because Brother Carmichael has a message for you. I'm sure he has a lot to tell you about his revolutionary struggle, about the revolutionary struggle. You asked for it, brothers. Okay, we're going to talk about law and order versus justice in America then. You see, Lyndon Johnson can always sit up and talk about, he can always raise an argument about law and order because he never talks about justice. But black people fall for that same argument and they go around talking about lawbreakers. We did not make the laws in this country. We are neither mor morally nor legally confined to those laws. Those laws that keep them up keep us down. You got to begin to understand that. See, justice is a joke in this country and it stinks of its hypocrisy. Johnson is Hitler's illegitimate child and Jagger Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover is his half-sister. And we must 
conduct our struggle on this level. We are fighting enemies of the people. America for centuries, for years, have blackmailed oppressed people with the threat of nuclear war and war in general. The natural reaction becomes not to fear war. This is the lesson we learned from Vietnam. They tell you your problem is unemployment. Well, I got a program that can employ every black person in this country overnight. <laughs> Ain't nobody in Vietnam unemployed. Think about that when you need a job. talking about revolution because that's the era that you're caught in. You're caught in a revolutionary era. See, black people are responding to a poem that Langston Hughes wrote a long time ago, a poem that was in the form of a question that was never answered. The poem was, What Happens to a Dream Deferred? It says, What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or does it fester like a sore and then run? Or does it sag like a heavy load? Or does it explode? Detroit answer that. <laughs> See, they used to call it Detroit, not it. But America is moving to combat that. She's saying this some of what we can't buy off, we gonna kill off. That's why she's building up our armories. Understand that. This is what the National Guard is all about. This is what the new weapons are all about. You see, the poverty programs for the last five years have been buy-off programs. In Harlem, which has been one of the greatest victims of the poverty program, how you act is nothing but an act. That's all it is. They give the brothers $45 a week to go to Manpower, to come to class at Manpower Training. That $45 a week goes into drugs. That's just enough to keep the brother hooked. That's all. They pay you enough to keep you hooked. The poverty program was not designed to eliminate poverty. Does not speak about the ending poverty. Does not speak about how poverty is embedded in this society. Rather, it talks about the effects of poverty, not the causes. Black people must address itself to the causes of poverty. That's oppression in this country. So black people all across this country are uniting. They must unite. And they must organize themselves. Everybody has a responsibility in that community. Women, men, children, take them out to Boy Scouts and get you a black guard. You must begin to take over your institutions, your schools. Because that's where the young minds are. The last time I was out here was for the Watts picnic. See, I don't believe that Watts burned down so they can have a picnic every year. But what they did during that time was that they took kids on weekend notice. They gathered up 7,000 kids and took them off to a military camp. That's a dangerous thing. Next year, they say they hope to take a million. What if they took a million and they didn't come back? Who go and get them, chump? <laughs> you must address yourselves to these problems. These are the problems you live with daily. They don't want your old hard heads. They want the young minds. You see, ours might be to do or die. But for the little brothers, there should be but the reason why. So now I really am going to end. Because, wait. And in ending, I want to end in the Swahili saying it says, La Sima to Sinda. Bila Shak, Bila Shaka, which means we shall conquer without a doubt. Black power.
Thank you. Tonight I want to talk about two things. The politics of education and politics and education. Two distinct, uh, two distinct and different things. Can you hear me? Okay. First of all, I want to give a little test, though. I know you didn't expect to be tested when you came. But when you hear the word inflation, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I hear a lot of people say money. Now, that's because you've been trained to think that when you hear the word inflation, you automatically think of money. But to inflate means to blow up. Right? Now, that's somebody who's trained. When a tra you know, like a trained person hears the word inflate, he thinks of money. An educated person would cross references. Here's the word, inflate, and he thinks about blowing up. So when people go around talking about inflating things, you know they have more than one meaning. Now, to go to another point, for example, Isaac Hayes is a good example of a cat who's been educated and not trained. He took the song, you know, that he sings by the time I get to Phoenix. People thought that, you know, everything that could be possibly be done to that song had been done until my man took it and turned it all the way around. He, he, you know, he was an educated person. See, a trained person operates on the basis of no cross-references. In other words, you cannot apply cross-references. An educated person can apply cross-references. Now, with this in mind, when we begin to look at the type of system see, that America allows through her education and through her training as a fact, you find out that the whole Mobility for cross-references has been limited and almost eliminated as far as black people are concerned and oppressed people in this country. Politics. We have to have a reevaluation of politics. See, we've been taught to think that when the word politics is mentioned as we are talking about Democratic and Republican Party. That's not the case. See, politics concerns everything that you do. Everything that happens in your life is political. The real question is, what, whose political end does it serve? If it does not serve your political end, then it is not beneficial for you to be political in that fashion. Now, the problem again, back to the whole thing of politics, the politics of education in this country. The problem with Negro is not the word itself. It was that a stereotype had been attached to that word Negro and that people were forced to live in accordance to that stereotype. In other words, you know, Negroes lived in constant fear of being, you know, like proven not sufficiently trained. In other words, if you split a verb in front of a blood a few years ago, a Negro, you split a verb, and that cat almost died for you. Because what you were doing, you were reflecting that you were not trained. Not educated, that you were not trained. See, and some of the most, you know, like so-called intelligent, some of the most educated people in the country are the most unintelligent people in the country. A good example would be Nixon, Johnson, all of these people with college degrees. And they have educated their education, they're trained, but, but they are unintelligent also. So that shows you that the type of education that's given in the country, the type of training, which is really training that's given in the country, has very little to do, to do with the intelligence of a person. Now students, for an example, you see your students either by accident or coincidence. But you're black, and that's a fact. You're oppressed, and that's a fact. And to deal with the reality of that oppression, you must begin to look at your situation as students, secondary, and as being oppressed first. And the skills that you acquire as a result of being education, how can we utilize those skills to eliminate that oppression? That becomes the question for students. Again, when you begin to understand the whole system of education in this country, Whatever you don't control can be used as a weapon against you. Anything that you don't control can be used as a weapon against you. Education has been used as a weapon against black people because black people have been trained to think a certain way. See, we do not control politics, so politics as it's known in this country 
is a weapon against black people. And when we begin to examine what politics is, we find out it's no more than a, uh, the apex of white cultural aggression. Nothing more. When a man tells you that you can only become free through voting, then he is restricting your mobility. He's restricting your freedom. You were born free. You must exercise your right to be free. That man cannot give you freedom. But when he restricts an individual and tells him that he can only become free by voting, then he has denied you your freedoms. He says, this is politics. The only way you can become free is by being political in the white sense, or in the sense of this country. But politics in this country, you see, the whole thing refers again back to what Camus once raised. He says, what better way to enslave a man than give him the vote and call him free? Does black people absolutely no good to be able to vote unless we can choose who we're voting for? Then when it goes down and you begin to dwell and look further into the political system of this country, you find out that there is no political party that's anti-property. So where do we fit in? Whether that property is us, or whether that property is land, or whether that property is a Cadillac, or whether that property is a credit card. No party in this country is anti-private property, anti-gain, personal gain, no party. So where does black people and oppressed people fit in into a political system like that? That tells us that we must begin to reevaluate the whole connotation that's been given to politics in this country. See, politics does not mean the Republican and Democratic Party. Politics does not mean the city and state government. Politics goes into something much further beyond that. Politics goes into what happens to your life every day. You see, it's a political decision that, that most black people in Harlem are junkies. That's a political decision. It's a political decision that black people were forced to be athletes. That's a political decision. It's a political decision that black people cannot occupy offices, or high offices in this country as they are called. That's a political decision. But note here, not that, you know, that would make any difference in terms of the whole thing of black people occupying offices. Because when you begin to understand the type of system that operates in this country, then you understand that it's not the individual who manipulates the system. It's the system who manipulates that individual. See, if Cleaver or Dick Gregory had become president in this country, it would make absolutely no difference because America would still be in the war in Vietnam because the country operates off what's known as the military-industrial complex, which says that war is profitable, which says that USS Steel must make steel for tanks because over 70% of the people employed in this country are either directly or indirectly employed by the military. That's the politics of the economy of this country. When oppressed people began to evaluate politics, we must understand that we have to create a politics that's relevant to us. We must create a politics that's relevant to our lifestyle. We must create a politics that's relevant to what we do every day. So when we talk about politics, when we talk about the political reality of the black community, we are talking about something that's beyond Democratic and Republican parties. And in that sense, we must understand that we must incorporate a, a revolutionary I ideology, I'm sorry, revolutionary ideology that pushes this type of political know-how and political knowledge in the black community. I want to talk about you know, that ideology at this point. And it has to be an ideology of revolutionary nationalism. See, this country fosters the idea of competitive individualism. In other words, you know, like he divides people. He divides, he tells you, be an individual, do your own thing. You cannot do your own thing if your own thing is not the right thing. You cannot do your own thing. You have to understand one of the most counter-revolutionary things that came out last year was the whole slogan of do your own thing. This is what black people have been doing for years. Now, if your own thing does not happen to be the thing that's right for the struggle, then it's incorrect. You can't do your own thing. The people run around here talking about, I'm going to do my own here. The junkies standing on the corner nod and say, I let you do your thing. Let me do my thing. <laughs> you have to understand that we must begin to talk about building a nation. We exist as a nation. 
The reason they kill black people are not because they exist as wealthy or uh, poor individuals. They kill them because they're black. So what you have to understand is that whether we recognize it or not, we constitute a nation. We must begin to employ nationalism in our struggle. Nationalism merely says that, you know, we are talking about usness or we-ness. Black people can no longer talk about I. See, that whole individual thing has to be thrown out. This is, you know, what one thing that college students have to understand because most of the cats who come down talking about I got my stuff together is cats who are coming out of college. You have to understand that, you know, you, if you're speaking, you have to be speaking for the struggle. You cannot be talking for yourself because I know what's going to happen if you get caught out there by yourself. You're going to be looking for everybody else at that point. <laughs> the whole thing of, you know, like collectivism, the whole thing that's not pushed in this country. If you understand again the politics of the country, then you understand why it is not pushed. You understand why America finds it profitable, in her sense, to push the whole thing of individualism. It's the whole rule of divide and conquer, when as America, the patriots America, of America do not exist as individuals. In reality, white people in this country do not exist as individuals. See, the police have a line talking about, well, we are minority too. That's not true, because they reflect the attitude of the majority of the people in this country. And white people, the white people who are racist, the white people, you know, who are capitalists and who oppress people, they reflect the attitude of the majority in this country. So they do not exist as individuals. So black people have to understand that whole thing of individualism is a luxury that we can ill afford. We cannot afford to be individuals in this country. We do not exist as individuals in this country. We must begin to hammer out an ideology of revolutionary nationalism that says that every group, black people should be nationalists, Puerto Ricans should be nationalists. You know, like, white people should be humane, nothing else. <laughs> See, because we cannot talk about white nationalism in this country at this point because of the way it's defined and what it means. We have to talk about white people being humane, nothing else. The American Indian can talk about nationalism. And when all of these groups, when these groups, you know, began to launch the type of revolutionary nationalism in their country, in their communities, when they become nationalists, then we can talk about waging a people's struggle. We cannot talk about waging a people's struggle in this country before then, before each individual group becomes nationalistic in the sense that they are organized and that they are together for their own purpose. And that purpose, you know, in the end result will be ending re of repression and oppression of the masses of people. Then and only then you can, can you talk about grouping and launching a people struggle in this country. Now, the whole thing of politics in this country is that the politics plays upon the individual. And one of the mistakes of the movement has been that we have been a victim of that whole thing of the individual. See, the man always points out an individual and he tells you that's your leader. He says that's your leader. Well, you have to examine what he's doing. When he pushes a guy out there and says that that's your leader, he also understands that he can pull that cat in. He can destroy that cat when he gets ready. See, we must begin to relate to concepts, not individuals. See, don't ask me, you know, like, what's wrong with Carmichael and the Panthers? Understand what they both are saying. If you understand the ideology that they're pushing, that's sufficient. Then you take a side on that ideology. Don't take a side on the personality. So you've got to understand the difference. You have to understand the difference between concepts and personalities. See, the man, he found out it, it's very easy to destroy an individual or to discredit an individual. But it's much more difficult to discredit a concept or an idea. So what he does is that he pushes individuals out. He tells you this is your leader. Black people will decide when they need leaders and they will decide who their leaders are. At this point, our job becomes, those people who understand the nature of the struggle, our job becomes to organize black people, to organize for revolutionary struggle. 
not to be projected as leaders. And at this point, the only force in the black community that will be able to wield the revolutionary ideology will be a political party, a party that pushes that ideology, some type of apparatus that speaks to black people. Because if you don't have an apparatus, if you don't develop alternatives for people, then the people are shuttled right back into the system. And you say, well, you know, we ain't making no progress. See, the role of the vanguard in any revolutionary struggle is to lead. When it ceases to lead, it ceases to be the vanguard. The vanguard is no more than the guardians of the struggle. And people have to understand, people with certain skills, that's your role. Students, that's your role. You have to occupy the vanguard position in the struggle because you have certain skills. Because you can do certain things. You cannot divorce yourself from that community. You cannot set your college apart from the community that you came from. See, down south, what happens down south in black universities, that when they build a black university, there, there's usually a physical boundary. It's a railroad track or a lake or something that separates that black university from black community. And so what happens is automatically black students begin to assume that they're different from the people on the other side of the track. So all of a sudden they get scared to go out there to where they got to buy their wine because that's all they're going across for. They get scared to go out there because they think it's an entirely different person on the other side of the track. Again, the man is divided. He's made black people think that they're different. That's again, again, that's a luxury we can't afford. You have to understand in terms of how the man moves, how oppression comes down. He stratifies the community. You examine what happened in terms of the Jews in Germany. He didn't just vamp on the Jews. He got them segment by segment, in other words. The rich Jews say, well, he ain't gonna mess with us. He just getting them poor Jews, them troublemakers. <laughs> the same thing happens here in the black community. During the rebellion, black people who were doctors and who were professionals said, well, they ain't gonna mess with us. They just getting the law breakers. But what really happened was that one of them doctors got caught out there in Newark and the cop whooped his head till it roped like okra. <laughs> Then he started talking about we and us. <laughs> See, but that's the whole, that's the nature of repression. Repression tends to force people together. And it becomes a question as to whether the vanguard can afford to wait till repression forces them together. Given that, you know, a lot of people, the masses of people even say, will be forced together as a result of repression. The question then becomes, can the vanguard afford to wait? until repression forces them together. See, if we are correct in our assumption that the man is coming down every day against black people, then where does that leave, leave us? If he has a timetable, if he operates off that timetable, is it the role of the vanguard to sit back and let that timetable expire, or is it the role of the vanguard to offset the timetable? This is a question that students, again, people who should be occupying vanguard roles in the struggle because of the skills that they have, nothing else. Because of the skills. You have certain skills that can be utilized. Students should be organizing welfare mothers. Students should be organizing young schools. You should be educating kids who are being trained every day. You should be educating. So you have to see your role because you have certain skills. You see a revolutionary is not only a person who shoots a gun. See, I think a lot of times we've overemphasized the role of the gun in revolutionary struggle. A revolutionary is not only the person who shoots a gun. A revolutionary functions in the struggle on whatever level he happens to be. See, there's something that's going on out at uh, the IBM plant. Somebody's out there sabotaging the machine. They don't know who it is. Could be Leroy Double O Soul Buckwheat Johnson, Jr. They don't know what's going on, but they're knowing that their machines are breaking down. He's committing a revolutionary act against that, against that company. So wherever you exist, you can exist in a revolutionary fashion if you are committed to revolutionary struggle. See, it's no longer adequate for us to say that we're going to have revolution by any means necessary. You have to begin to define the means that are necessary. You can't say struggle by any means necessary because again, you're allowing cats to do their own thing. 
You allow a cat to say, well, you know, I'm fighting the revolution in this way, Jack. I'm going to get some of the mass money. And that's how I'm fighting the revolution. You must lay down guidelines to the revolutionary struggle. And to do that, you must have revolutionary ideology. People have to understand that in terms of ideology, ideology is shaped as a result of struggle. You don't just sit up one night and come up with the correct ideology. That ideology happens as a result of struggle, of being out there working with people. And the mistakes that a lot of black people make in terms of going to the black community is that you go in there with a program. Go in with an ideology and work around the programs that exist. Don't go in there with a program. People got a program. They got to have a program to live every day down there. But go in there with an ideology that can tell that cat, I can make, you know, this a little easier on you. We have a revolutionary ideology that tells, you know, in terms of the cat who hustles, that, you know, if you do such and such a thing, you can, you know, in terms of alleviating the pressure and the oppression on other brothers, this can be done. Don't go in there and tell the brother, look here, man, put out on your hustling, you know, give up your numbers. What do you have to offer him? Infuse in his mind how can he use the money that he gets. You know, we need a cut of the money from the numbers to run a revolutionary uh, uh, organization. Then look at here, brother, this is what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about, you know, giving me a cut of the money that you're getting from the numbers. That's your revolutionary duty. That's your revolutionary obligation and your revolutionary duty. Don't go there and tell the cat, look at here, man, you got to give up that stuff. Because I got something better, it might be better. It might, but you're telling that cat to give up something that, you know, the way he, he knows how to live. That's his skill for a program that he has never tried, for a program that you don't know if it's going to work. See, because most of our programs is theory at this point. The application of theory is the proof of theory. When we begin to apply that theory, when we can tell a cat that we got something that'll work, that's when, you know, cats will begin to come on. Until then, we have to use people on a level where they exist. We can't tell a cat, look at here, man. I mean, I don't, you know, don't go to the wall unless we got an alternative for it. What alternative do you have for a cat who you don't let go to the wall? You either make him aware that he's gonna spend some time in jail and you prepare him for that. But to tell him, you know, just, hey man, don't go to the wall. The cat's gonna look at you and say, well, what you got better? What, you know, what you got to offer me, man? I might be able to go to the wall and become a typist. What do you have better to offer me? See, programs exist in the black community. What we have to do is to forge a revolutionary ideology that makes those pro programs work for the struggle, make the programs work for the struggle. Now in terms of the whole role of college students at this point, black college students in particular, you have you know, a vast, you know, there's a colony in Bethesda, a colony in Harlem, you're surrounded by it. We need people you know, to do work, to organize black people. We need people to go in and to work with black people, to infuse black people with that type of revolutionary ideology. Because if they don't have it, then every time Nixon comes up and screams that he got a new program, black capitalism, uh, which is, you know, a myth, then they're going to try it out. They're going to go for the ghost. You go for the ghost. You, you know, you laugh, but you go for the ghost. See, the whole thing, you know, like in terms of where we are at now, where a lot of us are at now, is that we have infused as an ideology, or foreign ideology, the whole concept of militant blackism. In other words, it has become sufficient for a lot of us to be black, to be black and proud. But understand that there is no contradiction between singing America is my home and saying that I'm black and I'm proud. There is no contradiction. So a lot of us are just at the point where we are black and proud. That's not sufficient. We must go beyond our dashikis, our beards, and our beads. You have to go beyond that. See, because we have to under... We have to understand that what happens in terms of a country of this nature is that you cannot talk about creating something until this thing has been destroyed. 
An old principle, the first principle of physical science says that two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So you cannot build where something exists. You cannot talk about building where something exists. And a lot of us are just at the point where, you know, like, we in our dashiki bag. But understand, you have to go beyond that. What you gonna do if the man come to your house and you ain't got nothing but a dashiki? You gonna beat him off with a dashiki? <laughs> Are you gonna butt in with your natural? <laughs> so that says to be black does not, not ensure survival. Just because I'm black does not mean that I will survive what this man has to put down. So we have to be you know, aware of that whole thing. That blackism is not an ideology. And people can be black and be individuals. A whole lot of dudes who were screaming that they were Negroes are now black and still doing the same thing. So we have to go beyond that whole concept of just, you know, the natural and the dashiki. Because, you know, if you look at in terms of, you can really gauge the, the tenor of the country by the way they program you over the, the idiot box. In terms of the TV thing. Okay, you used to have I Spy, which was an extension of the Long Ranger. <laughs> It was a logical extension for the long range. I mean, my man was Tonto, nothing else. It was Tonto. But then you look today, what you have on TV today, and on the radio, you got the dude in the blue dashiki, the Newport dude in the blue dashiki. On the radio, commercials. I mean, this reflects the air of militancy. This is a whole new thing. White folks will co-op dog shit, man, if it's to their advantage. If that's to their advantage, they will co-opt it. The militant black, they found it necessary to co-opt that to make it harmless. So they will show you the militant black. They show you a dude on, on TV. This dude, look here, he can't do wrong right. This cat can't do wrong right. But he's a militant. He a militant. He's standing out, he got on all his, all his uniform. He got on his uniform and everything. He's talking bad, he whooping. But in the end, whose side does he come over to? He said, well, yeah, this is my country, baby, and, uh, yeah, you know, and I, and I was going the wrong direction. I mean, the man programs. He programs. He's always wheeling and dealing, man, and you have to understand that the way he trains people, see, he trains people. He trains you to act a certain way. He will train you to be good black niggas. Because he has conceded blackness. The first political victory that black people won in this country was the fact that they said that we are black. They established the fact that, you know, we will not be recognized Negroes, we are black. The man said, wow, you know, okay. He said, you know, we'll concede that. We concede blackness to you. But we will not concede revolutionary struggle. We will not concede revolutionary nationalism. We'll concede blackness. Because then he still can sell that program about, you know, like, the whole thing of integrating. The whole thing of blacks integrating with whites. He just changed the word. He quit saying Negroes integrate with whites. Now he says black integrates with white. So you have to understand that he's still, he's just using black people. He's not using black people to speak the language of black people. He's just putting people in to mimic his language. Just new faces. It's the same old game. Just new faces. That's all a new color. You have to understand that the whole thing of incorporating and developing and forging an ideology is very important when you begin to deal with the masses of people, especially the vanguard, people who are the vanguard, people who will begin to articulate and people who will begin to supposedly educate the masses of people. You have to understand that what's necessary is an ideology that go goes beyond that whole thing of, you know, like, just physical state of blackness. Because what we are talking about is surviving in this country. That's the whole thing. We have to survive in this country. This country oppresses people around the world. It's not just here. It's not just in Vietnam. It's in Latin America. It's in Africa. It's all around the world. So if people became, but we, you know, we as individuals, we as black people hold the key to liberation to people around the world. See, if people in Vietnam were to become free tomorrow, that would not affect the freedom of people in North Korea. 
that would not affect the, pe the freedom of people in Puerto Rico. See, it's just like an octopus, you cut off his tentacles. He still got tentacles in other places. But if black people see themselves as being a colony in the eye of the monster, we got his brain. You destroy his brain and you, you free Vietnam, you free you know, Africa, you free Rhodesia, you free Latin America. Because this man is the chief oppressor of mankind. You have to understand that in terms of his wealth, his wealth is made through the oppression of people around the world. So when we talk about, you know, like replacing the man, when we talk about an ideology that's limited in scope, that does not talk about destroying the system, a system that demands exploitation, then we are talking about replacing the man. Whenever we talk about, you know, like, well, I don't want to destroy, you know, like this country, then you're talking about replacing. See, I'm as much against a black cat oppressing people around the world as I am a white cat oppressing people around the world. Wouldn't make me any difference. I would struggle just as hard against a black cat who oppressed black people because it would be necessary to oppress some people in this country if you took the seats. If all the white folks in the world were to die and black folks moved in on those seats, in the seats and assumed those positions and business went on as usual, then Vietnam would continue. Rhodesia would still be imprisoned and oppressed. And it would be because of the, you know, the economic pursuits of this country. The only way that this country can stay wealthy is that it oppresses people. Capitalism demands exploitation in some form of other people. So when we're talking about creating an ideology, we have to talk about the ideology that's free from that type of economic oppression and physical oppression. Because the physical oppression comes as a result of that economic pursuit. So we have to talk about, we have to begin to examine, we can't be immune, we have to examine all ideologies. We just can't be immune because the man says, well you, you know, that's communism, or that's socialism, you shouldn't talk about that. See, I mean, this is the role of the student, you have to begin to articulate that. And I'm not saying that, you know, you take a struggle and bring it over here intact. I'm not saying that, because you cannot import and export revolution. What I'm saying is begin to examine the concepts of socialism. Understand what the man means when he says that the entire wealth of the world belongs to all people. Which again goes back to what American politics is not based upon. Because American politics is based upon property and land. And a question that has to be raised at this point is how can you own land? See if white folks could figure out how to bottle air, they'll do it to make profit off of it. If they could figure out how to bottle air, they would bottle air. If they could figure out how, you know, to measure water in cubics and issue out water every day, they would do that. Because they could make profit off of that. So you have to understand that how in the world can people, you know, talk about owning land, water, and air? Because land is just like water and air in that sense. We have to be talk about using the modes of production, the technology. We're not talking about destroying the technology because technology is not an evil in itself. It's how that technology is employed, how that technology is used. We're talking about seizing that technology and using it to benefit mankind, not to oppress mankind. Do you realize that this country is technically capable of feeding people around the world? But they don't even feed black people here in the country. Over 500 black kids die each year alone in Alabama for lack of proper food and nourishment. Which again goes back to the politics of this country. And where black people are concerned on that level, that's the politics of genocide. He's exterminating black people actively. He's starving black people to get to death. So we're talking about seizing control of the technology and using it so it benefits mankind, so it benefits all black people all oppressed people, people around the world. And this is what we have to be concerned about. I'm going to end because I um, understand that there are some questions I mean, that people would like to raise. But in ending, I want to say that we have to consider ourselves as the authors of new justice. We have to see ourselves as the authors of a new justice. And wherever we find injustice and tyranny, we must stamp it. We must kill it. Frederick Douglass said the world belongs to the youth. Our job is to seize that. 
and to make the world more humane. That has to be the role of any revolutionary or any person who considers himself revolutionary. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None of us. Snick. The reason I articulated the sentiments of black people was because SNCC had a public forum, not because I articulated the sentiments better than the brothers on the streets or the brothers who didn't have that public forum. I don't think that you could articulate the sentiments of black people last year any better than they did in Detroit. So I think the movement is a leaderless movement, whereas we might influence people, we do not control people. Well, how does this solidarity come about if there is no specific leader? I think eventually there will. I think as the struggle progresses, you see, revolution does not occur in one stage. It's an evolutionary process, you know, like people go through different things. The masses of people become involved, then leaders are chosen. Right now you have a vanguard struggle that's occurring, where by groups are fighting about uh, discussing political ideologies, which are relevant, you know, which uh, should be incorporated into the struggle, or will be incorporated into the struggle. That's not to be misinterpreted with, you know, like, de-revolution, because it's just a phase of revolution. What about politics? Uh, where, where do black people fit into the political spectrum right now? Or should they at all? Well, politics is defined by the geographical and influential spheres of this country. It's irrelevant to black people, and it's irrelevant to the masses of people. The vote has been used as a tool of oppression against black people. I mean, Camus raises a very good point when he says, what better way to enslave a man than give him the vote and call him free? See, it does not profit black people or poor people anything to have the vote and not be able to select the candidates who they want to choose. Now, how can you choose between London Johnson, Nixon, Agnew, Wallace, and Humphrey? There is no choice. Evil is evil. There's nothing in between that. There were some lesser candidates. I think Gregory was running for office. Elders Cleaver. I think the vote can only be used as a tool of organization. We can only use the vote to organize our people. Now, to really believe that we can put someone in office and that these people would be responsive to our needs is naive, politically naive. Because even if one of the black candidates who ran for office was to take the office of president, then black people must be prepared to fight against that person. Why? Because, you see, the system mandates the action of the individual. The individual does not determine how this country will function. This country works off the military-industrial complex, which means that it's profitable to wage war. And unless you, you know, devise another plan, another scheme to sustain, uh, to boost this economy, then it's going to be necessary to wage war, whether, you know, a black individual is in, is in office or a white individual is in office. Well, so we're talking about a complete you know, a change in system. Uh, if Mr. Cleaver did win the election, don't you think that he could have conducted uh, the presidency in a unique manner that may not be, you know, compromising to the system you speak of? No, because, you, as I said, the system dictates the response of right. individuals. You see, individuals do not influence you know, politically, economically, or socially the attitudes or functioning of the system. Well, if politics as we know it here in this country is not the answer, what is? I think there has to be a reevaluation of politics. Now, there are definitions of politics that are relevant to black people. Chairman Mao says that politics is war without bloodshed and war is an extension of politics. I think black people have to begin to address themselves to the politics of revolution. Because we are caught up in revolutionary struggle whether we want to believe it or whether we want to be or not. So I think, you know, black people have to begin to think in a revolutionary fa fashion and create and construct a politically revolutionary platform. Is this going to be a race revolution or is it going to be a class revolution? I think, you know, like in terms of struggle and who will comprise the revolutionary uh, front of that struggle. It will be oppressed people. See, black people are in the vanguard position of the struggle because we've been the most dispossessed. However, there are other oppressed people in this country. Mexican American, the Spanish American community, the Puerto Ricans, American Indian, Japanese Americans, and even poor whites. But racism, I don't believe that racism will allow poor whites to form alliances with the revolutionary gr groups in this country. Do you feel that black people will ever have a strong political voice in this country in the formal sense as we understand it? You mentioned that you don't think that this could ever come about. Uh, is there any chance that it might? 
No, I see. I think it's a reformist, you know, like position to assume me to say that people, black people, will one day occupy in this system political offices of importance. Now, you know, this brings on a whole discussion of control. You see, and how you control, because anything that you don't control is used as a weapon against you. Now, in terms of black people occupying positions, America has created in Cleveland. Washington, D.C., and Gary, Indiana, a type of neo-colonialism. In other words, the man has set up a puppet regime. These black people that they are responsive to the needs and the realms of the Democratic Party and not of the masses of black people. If who's ever, who's, I'm sorry, if Johnson is president or whoever is president were to tell Stokes or Hatcher or Walter Washington to send black people to concentration camps, then there would be no discussion because they would see it as their job because they hold a position that's, you know, responsive or that's sensitive to the Democratic Party. Do you view those that are in prominent positions that are black uh, sort of a token uh, gesture on the part of the establishment, like a member of the Supreme Court bench that was a black member of the cabinet and so forth? I think that has to be examined in the sense of progress and as to whether black people have made progress in this country. My contention is that black people have not made progress in this country. America has given blacks some, some concessions out of political necessity, their political necessity. They gave Thurgood Marshall a position on the Supreme Court to appease black people. In other words, we didn't put Thurgood Marshall there. They can take Thurgood Marshall whenever they get ready. We put Adam in office. They took Adam out. They gave black people an astronaut, and they killed him. So what happens is that that has to be viewed in the light of concessions. The very fact that the man can concede a position to you tells you that you do not have a position of power where you can demand, or that you can mandate something. How do you think that the press has affected uh, the black situation in this country? I think news media and media in general uh, are, are very negative in terms of any revolutionary movement or any movement that, you know, forces the change of the status quo. Now, media has always been an enemy of black people because what media has done is media has always singled out people who had vanguard positions or vanguard attitudes and tried to make these people an enemy of the masses of people. In our case, you know, like, make, make individuals enemies of black people. Malcolm X would be a good example. More Negroes feared Malcolm, Malcolm X than white people because news media told black people that Malcolm was bad. Muhammad Ali, the reason that Muhammad Ali could be given the maximum sentence and the maximum fine and the black community did not revolt was because Muhammad Ali had been made an enemy of black people. Adam Clayton Powell could be legally lynched, politically lynched, and black people did not revolt was because the man had told black people that Adam Clayton Powell was an uppity nigger. He had legitimatized his own action through news media. So the news media is a tool of oppression. What about your personal experience with the press? Do you feel that the press has given you a fair shake? We see, uh, in terms of myself as an individual, you know, whether I get coverage or not, it doesn't make any difference. But in terms of ideas, in terms of the flux of ideas, or the flow of ideas, right, your I, see that, yeah, I, see, I see that the press has deliberately created a vacuum in terms of deliverance of attitudes or positions to the black community, which is to be expected. We cannot rely upon white news media to convey black revolutionary messages. So, you know, like the press is doing their job. It, it follows then that it will not be, uh, there's no way of forecasting when it's going to come about. Uh, uh, it's sort of a pressure that is building constantly. See, as I said, I think revolution is an evolutionary process. I right. think as repression increases, people must respond to that repression. Now, the dilemma that the black movement is in today is that, you know, there's a divisiveness that yeah. exists in the black community between what's considered cultural nationalists and political nationalists. Now, understand, the man or uh, system endorses cultural nationalism. He will give people money to open up dashiki sh shops, will give people money to open up bookstores, because he knows that if you keep the people thinking culturally, then they want to move politically. My position is that culture has to be political. Everything has to be political. And in terms of the struggle, that political direction will, you know, give rise to the revolutionary struggle as a result of the repression that will be brought down because of political struggle. 
See, I think that it's significant to note that the laws that have been passed in this country for the past past 10 years have been laws of a repressive nature to deal with black people. In other words, the omnibus crime bill speaks directly to black people. So the anti-riot bill tells black people when they can travel, how they can travel, and if they can travel. The McCarran Act of 1950, Internal Security, which came as a result of the Internal Security Act, created concentration camps in this country for black people. And so I think, you know, like in terms of the repression and in terms of the role of the vanguard groups, I think the, the role of the vanguard group is to bring that repression down before the timetable that has been set up by the system runs its full course. I think it's our responsibility to get the masses involved, and the way you get the masses involved is that you bring the repression down. When you begin to execute political programs, then if, out of necessity, the system have to do, has to do certain things to control or try to you know, put it in to the type of political action that you're executing. And by doing this, they involve the masses of people. The masses of people, from our position, from our viewpoint, is unorganizable. You can't hope to organize the masses of people. Oppression organizes the masses of people. White folks make more revolutionaries than I ever could make. Well, let's go back a bit. Let's backtrack. What happened with you and SNCC? Why did you uh, leave? Well, my term in, as chairman expired. Yeah. And you know, like, there was an election and Brother Phil Hutchins was elected program secretary. There was a restructuring of the organization because what had happened was that the man had effectively directed his repression and repressive laws against individuals. And when this had happened, you know, it, it created a vacuum. When I was off the scene, you know, like people who respond to me would not respond to other individuals. So what we did, we created a decentralized type of decentralization occurred in whereby we created other people to be spokesmen. See, people have to get out of the idea that individuals lead movements. See, it's the revolutionary is the individual who's on the other side of that camera. These are the people who will make the revolution. They have responsibilities to the revolution and to themselves. And you know, like, if individuals articulate positions, it's perhaps because they have public forums, not because they know more than anybody else, not because they are more pressed than anybody else. So black people have to begin to understand the role that they have to play in that revolution is determined by them. What about the future for you, Rap? Where will you fit in as this revolutionary process evolves? Uh, good question. In terms of the legal cases that I have in court now, the man, you know, like, is moving against me as an individual, to put me away, and to get rid of me and get me off, you know, out the streets. Now, I think, you know, everything hinges and pins upon the nature of the struggle that's conducted in this country. If black people wage successful revolutionary struggle in this country, then every black cat in jail, you know, he doesn't have to worry about being in prison because he's black. But, you know, my fate as the fate of, fate of you know, every other black person in this country depends upon what we do. Do you feel that you, uh, that the law is truly, justice is truly blind, or you feel that it's a... No, justice ain't blind, just to see white folks mighty well. As a matter of fact, justice means just us white folks in this country. See, for black people, justice is a joke. No such thing as justice in this country for black people. The courts are a tool of oppression. The courts, you know, like, help to execute the genocide, the type of genocide that has been practiced against black people in this country for 400 years. Why is it that uh, there's not much exposure about what you feel, if it is true, that uh, justice is not blind, that it does uh, favor one segment of the society? Why isn't it attacked more by uh, responsible agencies? The very reason that they're responsible means that, you know, the very statement, responsible agents, say that they're not going to respond. Because, you know, like, in terms of the status quo, the status quo is never attacked by the comfortable people the people who you know, profit from it. And so as to expect, you know, the responsible Negroes or the responsible white people, you know, to attack the system from the basis that poor people and oppressed people will attack it, you know, is out of the question. You say that America as it stands just just cannot be as far as a black man is concerned. Does this mean that the, the democratic idea not how it's practiced, but the idea of a democracy is not valid? Uh, I think that in terms of, you know, like, 
there has been no successful example of democracy as it's taught in this country. Not a, not, I'm not even talking about as it's practiced. I'm talking about as it's taught in this country. How about the Constitution? Looks good on paper. I think, you know, the Constitution has a lot of valid ideas and thoughts. But you see that the contradictions that exist in this country are created out of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. I mean, otherwise, you know, like, you know, Constitution is nothing but white people's paper. You know, it's advantageous and it's favorable for white people. They created constitutions. And contradictions to the Constitution when they added the 14th, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Rap, what effect is the end of the Vietnam War going to have on the situation here in this country? I think that if, you know, like America has ever run out of Vietnam and defeated as they should be in Vietnam, then black people over here will have to, you know, like, be in a position where they can defend themselves. Because I think that aggression, that aggression that's being directed against the Vietnamese people will be turned inwardly against black people in this country. See, America, in terms of where she goes and you know, like who she controls, the whole sphere of influence is diminishing. America is fighting on about five or six different fronts right now. Latin America, you know, like Africa, Middle East, and Vietnam, and here domestically. So I think that, you know, given the system and given that it operates off the military-industrial complex, which means that war is profitable and that, you know, like General Steel, or USS Steel, must make steel for tanks to hire people, you know, to give people jobs to, so they can spend the money to buy other goods. The very fact that the system operates off that principle mean that, means that when the man comes back, when the man is run out of every country, then it will become necessary to wage war in his own country. This is an utter contradiction to what a lot of politicians said, that when the war in Vietnam ends, then we can use all that money to sort of solve our racial ills here. No, it's not true, you see, because money has never been a problem for this country in terms of allotting money, because, you see, money here, it's not based on gold. It's not really based on the goods that produce. This is the lie that's been told, and it's been sold to black people as green power. Green power is a myth, you see, because as long as the man changes possesses the power to change the color of money, then, you know, like the color of money is not significant in struggle. He can give black people the, all the green money in the world and tell them they're using red money tomorrow. Black people have to go work for red money. In terms of what he did to the international monetary system, now, the United States has a budget, an annual budget of $800 billion. They had only $12 billion worth of gold. Now, in terms of their foreign spending, it exceeded the quantity of gold that they had in this country. So France was putting pressure on the United States by demanding payment in gold of it from paper currency. So what the United States did was that the United States said, okay, we're going to change the rules. They put pressure on the international monetary system, and they changed the whole international monetary standards from gold to paper gold. And they did that because they had power, not because the money they had was so good. They had power. Politics in this country is relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None other.